it just doesn't make any sense um, to try to uh, project racism onto Christianity. That it doesn't make any sense doesn't mean it hasn't been done with success. Um, if Christianity is one of sort of your guiding social narratives and you uh, need to import racism into it uh, in order to you know, carry out colonial uh, activities or, or other forms of racial oppression that uh, build wealth for a few, uh, then you're going to force that narrative and, and it can stick. Welcome to the Shorenstein Center's Speaker Series. I'm Richard Parker. My guest today is Elizabeth Brunig. She's a columnist at the Washington Post, where she writes about ethics, politics, theology, and economics from a progressive point of view. She lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband and her daughter, whom I've just seen a lovely picture of, the two-year-old Jane, who's missing her mom even now. Let's start by uh, discussing what would seem to Fox News a, a conundrum. What, what is it about the left that has any relevance to religion in America today? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of a, it's sort of a strange question because it comes from um, such a backward place. Um, the United States seems to be sort of the only country that can't see what Christianity and the left obviously have in common. Um, if anything, in the 20s and 30s, it seemed to be pretty obvious, not only to Christians themselves, but to people who are concerned about Marxism and the left, that Christianity had a pretty obvious affinity um, to the left. Certainly, it seemed more obvious that there would be Christian socialist parties than Christian fascist parties. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's sort of baffling that in the United States that ha connection has been so thoroughly shorn. Um, Christianity has, uh, has a moral logic to it um, that a lot of scholars argue proceeds directly into the moral logic of the left, sort of brotherhood, the equality of persons, the moral equality of persons, um, a, a more collectivist than individualist um, frame of mind um, throughout the whole Bible, and, and in, in the New Testament specifically a real emphasis on, uh, on mercy. Um, and, and once you move out of scripture and into the Christian tradition, the patristics, the earliest Christians, lived pretty radical lives, mm -hmm. um, and they left uh, a lot of writing behind to that effect. Um, so I focus on St. Augustine of Hippo. Um, there are certainly uh, much more radical thinkers in, in late antiquity and, and early Christianity than him. Um, he's an interesting fellow, but his teacher, St. Ambrose of Milan, was even more radical where it came to uh, the sort of problems with the institution of private property, um, the corrosive effect of wealth, uh, not only on society, but on the individuals who hold it and on politics. Um, and, and there are plenty of those in Maximus the Confessor, um, folks like that who have really, really great writing on, on what we would probably call today political economy. But it's really the moral logic of property and property ownership that they're very radical on. So roll back for our audience to the 1930s and give us an example or two of what you see as this connection between faith uh, and left or progressive politics so that they can anchor yeah. their understanding of what you're saying. Sure, so in the 30s, in 20s and 30s, you have this guy, John Ryan, who's a Catholic priest. Uh, I believe he was a Jesuit. Um, could be wrong on that. Uh, but I he had a very, you know, sort of straightforward position, and that is that, you know, if uh, productive labor is supposed to allow a person to flourish, if it's a part of human flourishing, um, then people who pay wages, employers, are obligated to pay a living wage, and if not a living wage, a family wage, a wage that someone can actually flourish on. Um, so the question of how wages should be set for Father Ryan, it had to factor in. Uh, what does it really mean for someone to flourish? It means for them to um, be able to have time away from work. It means for them to be able to have a life outside of work. It means for them to be able to have meaningful social relationships and meaningful family relationships to take part in family life and the sacramental life of the church. And if all of those things are going to have to happen for a person to flourish, uh, then the role of the wage payer in society is to pay wages that permit that. And that's not going to be a, a very low or poverty wage. It's going to be a living wage. We call it a living wage day. He call it a family wage. Um, there were also priests in Germany at the time. Alfred Delp um, was in contact with Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, and Delp also talked about this existence minimum. Um, so these are sort of uh, proto-Christian social democrats, people who say that, you know, the government has a role in the world, it has a part to play in the order of things, um, and that is to aid and assist and provide a floor sort of for human flourishing. And, and this was contrary to, you know, uh, contrary to the thought we have now on wages and, and the role of the state, but it was certainly contrary to the thought that was going around then. And, and a lot of it was sparked by you know, sort of turbulence, economic turbulence around that time. Um, 
but it hung on. I mean, you still see John Ryan referenced today, um, and, and I think that uh, there's nothing about his work that makes it inapplicable. It's still relevant. So you've, you've spoken eloquently so far about the, uh, the Christian tradition, in particular the Catholic tradition. Help our uh, listeners understand better what were some of the threads that were moving through American Protestantism and American Judaism, for example, in that same period and also today. That might be very helpful. So I'm actually less clear on American Judaism. I wouldn't want to speak on something I don't have too much uh, knowledge of. But there were certainly radical movements in American Protestantism and had been in American Protestantism since abolition. Um, you had always had the sort of peace churches in American Protestants were Quakers and Mennonites that had always been sort of skeptical of the US government in certain ways. Um, and then you had had sort of social progressives and a social gospel come up um, through the late 1890s, early 1900s. And those people um, in large part moved into labor. So Heath Carter has a great book on um, the sort of evangelical roots of labor organizing in Chicago. Um, and, and there were certainly evangelicals who were involved in that kind of vivid labor movement that was coming up during the Great Depression era. And then we think today of white evangelicals as being overwhelmingly conservative. The data we see is that 80% of white evangelicals chose to vote for President Trump uh, and that that pattern of support for conservative Republicans has been consistent now for at least 30 years. And yet, for a long period before that, they were just as solid a block for the Democratic Party. Can you say something about what changed in that particular group of white evangelicals that led to that party uh, reaffiliation? Yeah, so I mean, on, on some level, the Democrats changed, the Republicans changed, the parties have changed their orientation. Um, there's been polarization going on for a long time. And I think that um, sort of two issues that came up in the 60s uh, late 60s, early 70s, sort of pushed evangelicals, white evangelicals, towards a realignment. Randall Balmer argues, and I think he makes a very compelling Randall case. Randall Balmer, Dartmouth yes. College, yeah. Uh, that, you know, a lot of it had to do with segregation. Mm -hmm. um, that white evangelicals, a lot of them were based in the South. Um, when desegregation was becoming an issue, uh, they didn't like it, not for religious reasons, uh, though they tried to pose it in religious language from time to time, but mainly just for cultural and political reasons. They were racist and they didn't want to desegregate. Um, and this all kind of comes to a head in the Bob Jones University case, um, where the universities are not going to be allowed to receive federal funding. Bob Jones is a private university, right. very religiously conservative, founded by a minister named Bob Jones, Bob Jones right, 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 coincidentally. And so uh, they're, they're going to have to either desegregate or stop receiving federal funds. Um, and, and this becomes a big eruptive controversy in the evangelical world. Um, and, and at that point, um, you start to see a lot of the evangelical uh, rhetoric around the state being a sort of danger to religion and having to preserve a very strong um, religious freedom. Um, and it all tracks back to, or a lot of it tracks back to that case. The other one um, has to do with abortion, right? That abortion becomes an issue after Roe versus Wade. Um, previously, you sort of saw Protestants all over the map mm -hmm. on abortion. Um, and then after it becomes this sort of highly charged political issue, um, the Republicans pick it up mm -hmm. as, uh, as uh, something that they will lead the charge on. Um, and then you start to see um, the sort of life movement crystallizing this Republican um, evangelical block and, and segregation was also a part of that and, uh, and then it crystallized over time. So uh, African Americans are by and large evangelical as well too and yet clearly are voting uh, for Democrats at the same high percentages that white evangelicals are voting for Republicans. Talk a little bit more about the role of race in dividing a camp as large as the evangelical Protestants. Well, evangelical, I mean, evangelical is a term that um, I think there is often less there than it seems. We, we, we know who we mean when we say it, um, and there are scholarly arguments for what constitutes an evangelical, but in, in many cases you're looking at actually very different Christians. Um, they're Protestant, they're going to be focused heavily on the crucifixion, they're going to be focused on redemption and rebirth, um, sort of born-again type Christianity. Um, but outside of that, there are big differences in liturgy and practice and in, in there's variation in income, so there are class differences as well as racial differences inside the evangelical cohort. Um, the evangelicals who are black, who are poor, who uh, concentrate on lower class, working class, um, there's always been that tradition there of a kind of liberatory Christianity, of a liberatory evangelical um, practice. And, and I think that it still survives very well um, in black churches. Um, on the other hand, 
evangelicals who are white, evangelicals who are more well-to-do, who mm -hmm. are up in the middle class and upper middle class, um, there you see this sort of um, more staunch Republican um, alignment. So some of it has to do with material interests. What you think the government ought to do is going to have a lot to do with what you want to have happen to your money. Um, people with a lot of it reason differently about it than people with not a lot of it. Um, Everybody thinks about redistribution. It's just the direction. <laughs> it's the just the direction, right? right. Yeah. And uh, and so um, that can break up the uh, that can break up the cohort. Um, and then there are still uh, sort of very relevant racial issues in terms of. Um, police brutality and having the state respond to institutional racism um, that breaks up the cohort as well with the liberation tradition um, sort of pushing back very strongly there have been very strong faith responses to police brutality um, and to sort of incipient white nationalist movements um, in Charlottesville for example there have been very very strong um, black church responses and white progressive Protestant responses. Um, and, then, and then on the other side of that, you have um, white evangelicals in some cases who are less interested in, in a strong response to those um, issues, who take more of a tough on crime um, approach, and that's sort of, uh, that's where you get a real tension. One, one branch of this big Protestant American family uh, that we haven't talked about yet are the so-called mainline Protestants who are self-aware in terms of being different from the evangelicals, and the evangelical, white evangelicals are keenly aware that mainline Protestants are different. But what, what are mainline Protestants, and why have they had a particularly powerful role in American history? So mainline Protestants are um, not evangelical. They come from those established denominations, sort of Methodists, Episcopalians, um, Lutherans. And uh, they have been established in the United States for a long time, and they don't take the kind of um, sort of disorganized, broken up approach um, to, to especially church organization that evangelicals do. So evangelicals um, oftentimes don't have to or don't necessarily belong to a bigger convention or organization. Methodists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Lutherans, they usually do. Um, and they have um, sort of denominational liturgies that are separate and different. Um, they were big in the abolition movement. Um, they were active in civil rights. Um, if anything, the impact of white mainline Protestants in recent years has, become to de has, has come to decline as, as they have come to decline. Their, their numbers are in decline. Evangelicals have actually held steady, um, but white- White evangelicals or white, white and black? Okay, okay. Um, have actually held pretty steady <coughs> in terms of numbers, but white mainline Protestants have sort of been on the decline. Nonetheless, um, they are well organized and they're very active right now, for instance, in the sanctuary movement. Mm -hmm. A lot of those um, churches who are holding people who are um, trying to stay in the United States, um, providing them sanctuary, uh, those are mainline churches in a lot of cases. Um, and they were active in the 80s sanctuary movement as well, when there were lots of refugees coming here from Central America. And they're relatively small as a percentage of population now, yes. under 20 percent, maybe 15 percent, yes. but once were maybe 30 or more percent, yes. is that right? Uh, and at elite levels, even more influential. I saw the data not too long ago that said of the roughly four dozen men who've been president of the United States, half of them belong to just two small mainline denominations, the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians. So they clearly have had pr prestige and political throw weight for many, many years. So Yeah, well, I mean, uh, um, Protestants have never had to struggle in America. Um, <laughs> not, well, they're not, getting used not, to being a minority as to the last couple of years. So. But, um, the, yes, I mean, certainly a lot of these great schools that you see up in the Northeast have, have, have strong Protestant roots. Um, and, and a great educational background. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of place for, uh, a lot of pathways for Here, white mainline Wills, Protestants. I thought too. usefully, although this is far too condensed, once said that he thought of the division between the mainline and evangelical Protestant traditions as that between the head and the heart, that there was a much stronger intellectual tradition associated with the mainline uh, Protestant tradition and a much more profound emotional and immediately emotional <laughs> kind of uh, attachment to Christianity represented by the evangelical. Does that sound right or is that too simplified? Or It sounds right. It doesn't credit um, white evangelicals enough for the political work they've done, mm -hmm. which has been, you in know, the last in, in, in the years. last 30, 40 years since, mm -hmm. you know, the late 70s. Um, that's highly <coughs> theorized. Mm -hmm. um, I disagree with a lot of it, um, but it is theorized and there has been an effort to sort of construct a story about why Christianity is, you know, naturally hospitable to a kind of, um, free market, 
um, family values type Republican government. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, again, you can disagree. You can think that there's some spurious reasoning going on, but 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 reasoning it is, which means a couple of things. Um, it means you have to credit them with making an effort to come up with a theoretical story that grounds what they're doing, um, and it means that they're in some cases perhaps not as simply moved by emotion as they might suggest. All right, fair enough. So talk to us a little bit about the relationship between religion and its multiple forms and the left, if you can give us a definition of the left and its multiple forms today. What are the points of intersection? Where can we look for influence or impact? So it's hard to come up with a simple definition of the left. If you want to use the sort of, I like Corey Robbins' definition of the left, and he's a controversial figure. Um, but I, I like his idea of the left as a sort of a, a very loose coalition of liberating impulses. Um, so it's all people who are brought together with this intention of upending hierarchy or oppression in whatever forms it presents itself. And they all disagree with each other from time to time, and they have different methods and different praxis. But, but that seems to be the impulse. Um, and, and Christianity, you know, there's a very clear affinity um, just from the story of the life of Christ with, a, with an interest in upending um, oppression, with putting the last first, with raising up the poor, um, with centering people who are meek and have needs and are weak, um, and, and not allowing the powerful to sort of run rush out of society, which is such a large part of Christ's message. In fact, it's in Mary's Magnificat um, when she prays and thanks for having <coughs> been made the mother of God. Um, so that, that intersection, that, that very first impulse to support people who are being oppressed, to champion their cause, mm -hmm. um, to not immediately presume, for instance, that there's a reason that they were simply, that they were oppressed or, or that their oppression is due to them in some way. Um, that's, I think, a, a major intersection between Christianity and the left. And it's why, despite all the conflicts between Christianity and the left, and there are conflicts, um, and there have been, you know, more specifically conflicts between leftists and Christians um, over time, um, I still think that they, they have a hard time getting away from one another. Um, and they, you know, keep drifting back and forth. So Terry Eagleton just put out this great book called Radical Sacrifice, mm -hmm. which is, you know, another mm -hmm. one of his on, uh, on the sort of way in which Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is this ultimate liberatory statement. Um, and, and I think that as long as there are Christians and leftists, there's going to be, you know, these wonderful arguments, but also uh, an inability to really shear off from one another just because the impulses are so similar. Now, when social scientists look at today's mix of uh, religious traditions in the United States, the thing that seems to be most noticeable is the rise of the nuns. Could you talk a little bit about that and explain to our audience why the nuns are not Catholic women in, uh, in orders that <laughs> refer to something else? The N-O-N-E-S, the N -O -N -E -S, nuns. The nuns. Um, so these are uh, folks who answer none um, to religious affiliation, and they're an interesting group. A lot of them still claim some kind of um, spiritual belief um, they, a lot of, more of them believe in heaven than hell, for instance, which is very optimistic on their part. Um, <laughs> you, you still see some um, belief in um, spiritual beings and things like that among nuns, but they're not affiliated. And I think that that probably comes out of a number of changes that have taken place in American society. One of them that we can track really well is that um, Christianity became very publicly affiliated with sort of right-wing social causes. Um, throughout the 80s and 90s and the moral majority. Um, and, and young people just sort of didn't really want to be caught with Jerry Falwell. I mean, they, they <laughs> didn't really uh, have an interest in, in, uh, in the anti-video game, anti-movie, anti-pornography, anti-abortion, anti-gay marriage um, thing. And as, you know, the sort of evangelical block more and more solidified the notion that that is the real Christian uh, active base in society, that they have the line on what the legitimate Christian position is in society, <clears throat> a lot of young people especially um, just said, well, then I'm not affiliated, I'm, yeah. I'm doing my own thing. And then the other half of the equation is that uh, America, just being a liberal society, we have an individualizing ethos, and uh, people are very inclined to come up with uh, their own thing and, and to do what they want separately. So there's really nothing in terms of you know big cultural mores that keeps young people attached um, to organized religion. They have no real reason, in terms of social messaging, to stick with organized religion. They just drift off and do their own thing. Has family change been a big factor? I mean, intermarriage across different traditions. I mean, 50 years ago, to marry outside one's faith, 
met an Irish Catholic marrying an Italian Catholic <laughs> or a Russian Jew marrying a German Jew or a, an Episcopalian marrying a Presbyterian. It's become much broader. And that's had some impact. And also divorce must have had an enormous impact on the cohesiveness of the family in relationship to worship, right? Right. I mean, there's, there's the issue of inherited religion becoming a little bit more complicated with mm -hmm. lots of intermarriage and divorce. And then there's also the issue of, um, you know, so divorce becomes much more common throughout the 80s, 90s, and early aughts than it had been in the 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. 40s. Um, and, and, you know, Christianity has a, a uh, you know, especially in conservative denominations and Catholicism, there's a very pronounced in particular position on divorce and so we're, we're aware of that yeah, yeah that which the catholic church is, is having it out about right now um and so if you're a child of divorce if you're in that position it's easy to say you know i just don't see myself reflected mm -hmm. and my life situation um sort of reflected in the in the messaging i'm getting from my church so um i'm going to seek it elsewhere and sort of a mix of my own personal seeking and thinking so you've mentioned, and we're all keenly aware of the rise of the religious right, of the Christian right in the 1980s and 1990s, and there was for a time the idea that there, this would give rise to a reaction and the appearance of a large and fairly well-organized religious left. D have you seen that happen, or did I miss it, or was I, what, was that in the papers and I just skipped that day, or what? I wish. Um, I really do wish. I think that you know one of the problems with um, building a Christian left that matches the Christian right in terms of its political activities is that there's just no funding for it. Who with a lot of money is going to fund someone who says, I don't think you ought to have a lot of money? It's just uh, it's not a reasonable thing to do. Um, and so you don't see funding pouring into Christian left activism like you do see funding pouring into uh, Christian right activism. There is no coke of the left, and there never will be. And, uh, and so the Christian left does exist. There are progressive Christians. There are plenty of them. It's just difficult to find the funding to organize and to lobby. The way are there smaller left Christian or left religious or left Jewish or left Muslim institutions that people here would like to know about that you could point to? Or like We talked a little bit about Sojourners, yeah, for example. What are, what are some of the others? Sojourners, uh, there's America Magazine. So I know a lot of publications. Okay. Um, America Magazine is run by the American Jesuits. Um, it's not expressly sort of left-wing in the way that Jacobin or something is left-wing, but you know the Jesuits. Um, and then, <laughs> <laughs> so they, uh, you know, they have a bent. And, uh, and it's right. good, and it's, it's a lot like John Ryan. I mean, it's a lot like the Catholic story on, on social teaching has been for a really long time now. Um, First Things, which has been traditionally a very conservative sure. um, religious publication, recently had an editor come out as a socialist. Mm -hmm. um, and so, John Newhouse, you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was it was Matthew yeah. Schmitz, oh. um, who's this young editor, um, who who favored uh, the socialist side in a socialism versus capitalism debate that took place in New York, causing something of a row actually. And there were lots of um, uh, responses in in Catholic media about what that could possibly mean. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, to see something the, the house of first things, this strong beacon of Christian conservatism in the 80s and 90s. So, uh, having a, a left-leaning bent, a little bit of red in it, uh, was a real shock. But uh, but that's one to watch as well for that reason. Um, we've talked about sojourners, mm -hmm. um, sort of Jim Wallace, the liberal Protestant, um, progressive Protestant publication. It's a great magazine. They do a lot of really good work. Um, and then there are just lots of churches on the ground that are doing um, sanctuary work, that are doing poverty relief. They um, that have offices in Washington that actively lobby on yeah. issues of moral concern to their members too, yeah, right? Yeah, definitely. And and I mean, uh, it, it's hard to overemphasize the the necessity of sort of grassroots participation in local church organizing around poverty relief, around um, you know, we call social insurance, mutual aid, um, and uh, and sanctuary. At this point, they need hands on deck, um, but they're there. We haven't talked about it yet, but I'd like to talk about it. Women are playing a much more active role in many Protestant denominations and many Jewish denominations. Not so much yet in the Catholic Church within the priesthood itself, but in, in areas directly around the priesthood in terms of, uh, of leadership. Talk to me about how that's changing religion, the, the increased role of authority that women are finding for themselves. Yeah, I mean, women have always had a really interesting role in Christianity. I'm too zoomed into Christianity in terms of like looking at uh, late antiquity and medieval history to see it the way that most people see it as this sort of vastly male and very minimally female story. I see it as actually vastly female. There have been lots of women involved who are very important and very central to the Christian story um, from the very beginning. And a lot of them were funders of the early church. Um, they were early adherents. 
um, the early Christian church are strewn with all these fantastic female saints, like Perpetua and Thecla, um, who have really amazing stories um, and whose personalities influence the formation of the church. Um, and, and you know, now the role of women is moving more towards um, the official and the formal um, than maybe the moral leadership role mm -hmm. they've had in the past. Mm -hmm. Not that you can't have both of those things at once, um, but that mm -hmm. is a change taking place. I think you see it a lot in American nuns. Um, this is the NUN the, the nuns. nuns. The, the other right, nuns. Right. Um, in 2017, oddly enough, the, um, the year which was not long ago but feels a very long time ago now, um, <laughs> there were like several sort of big movies about nuns, interestingly enough. And, and I think it's because nuns have a, a moral authority in society. They have a way of speaking to moral issues that it's hard for the priesthood to do. Um, in certain respects because they're thought to be sort of caught up in the bureaucracy and the money and the, the churning of the Catholic Church as an organization. But nuns are seen to be sort of doing on the ground work. They are doing charitable work, they're doing mission work. And so they have a way of speaking um, that is easily amplified and I think that people take very seriously. So Sister Helen Pujan has been doing anti-death penalty advocacy for many decades now and is still uh, a voice on that front. Um, and, and Sister Simone has been doing sort of nuns on the bus and sort of lobbying for um, a fairer society uh, in terms of um, programs. Okay. Now, in terms of the political parties, when one looks today, uh, increasingly one sees articles about the uh, strong differences in the role of religious affiliation in the two parties, with the Republican Party increasingly looking like a white uh, Christian, evangelical Christian, or conservative mainline Christian, uh, and conservative Catholic. Whereas the Democratic Party is vastly heterogeneous, is that a fair description? Is that? Yeah, I think. In fact, I think the biggest single religious constituency inside the Democratic Party is the nuns. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest single group, and then everyone else is a. And know, this is the disaffiliate, the non-institutional. Not the sisters. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the nuns. <laughs> now, do you look at particular places that others here might uh, find useful? where you can get lots of good information about trends in American religion. I, I know that the Pew Center has been for many years a, a, a go-to place, but more recently PRRI seems to be getting a lot of attention. Can you say something? Pew and PRRI are both really great um, in terms of doing surveys and polls and sort of getting empirical information out about changing trends in American religious affiliation. Um, I've always sort of been interested in theology, so you sort of think about religious affiliation as the external story, as people saying they're affiliated or what they believe. And then theology is sort of um, where you get into, okay, but what ought they be doing? Um, and and the, the actual substance and stuff uh, of religion, what constitutes this religion, what ought this religion do or say about this or that. Um, and so that's kind of always the front I've been more interested in. And um, you can also follow those debates, those internal debates. Catholic Church has a big synod coming up. They're going to have big debates. Um, people where would one look for that? Uh, I, for your generation online, I would ask what magazine or <laughs> newspaper. But so you want to follow Catholic stuff. Crux is great, um, which is a magazine that used to be it's an online publication that used to be under the auspices of the Boston Globe, um, which mm. has done great reporting on the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. um, and I think now is its own independent uh, entity. Um, but it's just, just straightforward news reporting on the Catholic Church. And then here and there, there are some opinion pieces that are interesting and kind of provide context. Um, our own Sarah Pulliam Bailey at the Washington Post <laughs> is our religion reporter. Yeah. She is fantastic. I've never known someone as, as dedicated and as ear to the ground as Sarah is about picking up what's going on, and this is all across American religion. Um, Julie Zosmer is another uh, religion reporter at the Washington Post, and Michelle Borstein. Um, and those are sort of our three all-star religion reporters. You sort of follow them on Twitter, you can follow them on, on uh, the website, just get an RSS feed going of their articles, and that'll keep you very much up to date on the sort of latest and greatest. What about Religion News Service, RNS? Is that still functioning, still yeah. influential? RNS is interesting. Religion and politics is interesting. Um, Christianity Today um, mm -hmm. still has uh, pretty good articles, and you know, people trade scoops. Um, one person, one one publication I'll have it this week. <laughs> one publication the next week. Um, but yeah, I think those are good, strong sources. Let me uh, turn to the audience now and let you get in asking some questions. I'm going to favor students first. So, if you're not a student, keep your hand down for just a minute. Students. There's one question that I want to ask that uh, baffles me for uh, a long time which is there is a whole sense of Christianity and within Christianity that we are all created uh, with a free will, right? It's an important thing in Christianity because that's where sin lies, that's where, uh, that's pretty much what we are, right? We have choice and intent. Um, 
and, and, and still Christians uh, try to make their points or, or enforce Christian belief through law, through legislation, through policy, which is uh, it, it counterintuitive because instead of saying, telling people you have to convince them not to sin, you are trying to forbid them from sinning uh, through law. Isn't that just lazy, uh, <laughs> lazy Christianity? You're just, just a, a lazy pastor that, yeah, I'm not going to go through the lens of trying to convince you. Just pass a law, forbid it, and you cannot do that. Yeah, thank you very much. So the question sort of to, to restate for you guys is, isn't there sort of a contradiction between the Christian emphasis on free will and then the uh, emphasis on legislation in American Christianity? Uh, I agree that there is a, a problem uh, there. Um, so the way that Augustine threaded the needle um, when he was, he was a very politically active bishop uh, of Hippo, North Africa, and sort of the end of the Roman Empire. Um, and, and he sort of said, well, you know, it's the role of the government to maintain order. There are some things um, which are highly disorderly and very disruptive society that prevent people from flourishing, um, which are sins and should be outlawed, not specifically because they're sins, um, but just because they cause such a damage to the public order um, that they prevent the government from doing its job and everyone from sort of functioning in the uh, canticle of creatures and their role in the song of all things. Um, and so that, that makes some sense. And so that's one part of the equation is that there is a Christian story about government having a particular role um, that is restrictive of evil. It cannot save you. It will not result in salvation. You being legally prohibited from doing the evil things you want to do um, doesn't mean that you don't want to do them and that itself is an act of ill will. Um, solving that is between you and God. Um, but it can protect the functioning of society on some level. Uh, and Augustine is very straightforward about distinguishing, sort of restraining people from inflicting harm, causing chaos, from um, affecting a conversion inside them that would cause them to not want to do that. Those are separate things. Um, the government can set an example. It has an educational role. Laws can teach us about morals. Laws, of course, are moral ideas, um, and they are um, expressive. Laws tell us things. So the full force of the polity in the case of a democratic republic says, uh, murder is wrong. That tells you something. It doesn't just tell you that I'm going to get in trouble if I murder. It tells you that everyone around me, this big body of people that I'm integrated into, we believe that, mur that murder is wrong and that it is an affront and offense and, in, and down on the line. Um, and so there is also that aspect of the government teaching with legislation. Then you flip over to the side of Christianity that has a different relationship with free will. So Augustine believed in free will, basically. Uh, there were some questions that came up uh, about the absolute freedom of will and how grace operates. That's where you kind of get a little bit muddy with Augustine um, and you, you just kind of have to pick out very, very minimal threads. So in the interest of not doing that to y'all. Um, and we will stay away from Calvin. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, so, so that's the, that's the <laughs> other half of it is there are, um, there is certainly a, a uh, yeah. determinist version of Christianity um, that is Protestant, that is not particularly emphatic about free will if, uh, if it trusts the concept whatsoever, in some cases expressly reject it. Um, people do not have free will. People are made to either be saved or destroyed. Um, and, and they're going to operate according to the way that God created them. And all of that unfolds within the greater will of God. Um, that's why you see kind of interesting Q and A's unfolding with people like the Westboro Baptist Church, sort of primitive Calvinist, when people confront them with, well, people are going to be saved or damned no matter what you do, so what is it with the sign act? They say, like, we're not even trying to tell you. This is just something we have to do. God tells us to do this. There's no real logical reason. It's not related to you. It's related to us. It's totally duty-based. We're not even trying to affect change in you because we don't think that's possible. Um, it's just our job to go around holding these signs and saying this stuff. Um, so in, in that case, with that particular view of free will, and that is an extreme uh, view of free will, um, <laughs> they, they, have a very, uh, they have a very extreme, um, if you hadn't noticed, um, <laughs> approach to the, <laughs> to, the, to the whole religion. But, but with that kind of thought, you can start to get different views on, on legislation. Um, it's purely about uh, restricting people. It's purely about sort of protecting the people who are trying to um, live out good lives and, and, and be saved. And um, whether or not the laws change anyone or impact anyone or even could impact anything is much less part of the question. It's we have a duty to make these laws. We must make these laws. We must make this moral statement. 
the way that the laws impact, if they impact at all, um, is, is a sort of secondary question in that framework. I'm Maria Ramirez, I'm a Neiman Fellow here. Um, president Trump might be one of the least religious uh, presidents ever elected, and still he got uh, most of the vote from evangelicals, even Catholics. Uh, do you think his current behavior, not very in line with any religion, could like change that over time? And is there an opportunity for Democrats uh, now? Thank you. Thank you very much. So President Trump is sort of comically indifferent to religion. Um, he just, uh, <laughs> there's just sort of never been a politician who's had as major a platform as Trump has, especially on the right, who just has openly not cared um, as much. He, he described, I think, the Eucharist as eating his little cracker. Um, <laughs> Um, Maybe this is his duty. <laughs> this just has to, do it. has to do it. He says he has a room full of Bibles, which seems unlikely to me. <laughs> 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 um, and then, um, you know, if, if news reports are accurate, uh, there's certainly evidence to suggest he, he um, hasn't been the most chaste um, <laughs> president we've ever had. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I think that the fact that he still won evangelicals at the levels you'd expect a Republican to win evangelicals, there are a lot of reasons that that might have been the case. I think that um, Lydia Bean is a great writer on evangelicals. She's from Texas as well, like I am. And, uh, and her view was sort of that Trump was at least honest with evangelicals. He was like, look, I've paid all of these politicians. They're all on my payroll. He would do that during the debate, say, I've donated to you and you and you. People with money like me are really the ones running the show. I'm at least telling you the truth. And, and that reflects, I think, a lot of sort of disgruntlement that's unfolded in the evangelical right over the years. They have gotten very frustrated with Republicans receiving all of their support and money um, and not necessarily focusing on carrying out the projects they wanted to. All these years later, Roe versus Wade, still the law of the land, all of the um, movements that the right has made on abortion has been, have been pretty much on the state level. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't need to be voting in Republican presidents to have that happen. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, what's in this for me going on at this point um, inside the evangelical right, especially among the elites who interact more with the, with the politicians. And I think that Trump promised to destroy everything. He, his whole thing was he was gonna come to Washington and turn everything upside down and, and throw a wrench in the gears. And I mean, he has. And, uh, and if you are a disgruntled evangelical who is right-leaning but is frustrated with right-wing politicians who you view as too easily cowed, uh, as too sensitive, as too wishy-washy, as too bought out and suborned, then Trump seems like a, an interesting figure if for no other reason than you can't bribe someone who has all the money in the world. You can't bribe the person who's doing the bribery. Um, so you think. So and, this uh, is the Samson strategy playing itself out. Right, right, right. Just, just bring the whole house down. I mean, and, and I think that that is the most sort of charitable and positive um, explanation um, for evangelical attraction at Trump. The others that are just more uh, sort of primal are, you know, well, he seemed virile, he was tough, he was mean. Um, if you're sort of mad at the other half of society, if you're mad at progressives and Democrats for, for what you perceive them to be doing to society, Trump seems like someone who's going to call them names and make them really upset. And that's also attractive. And again, white evangelicals, they're a mix. They're a mix and they're different people, all of them, and they're all going to have different motives for doing what they do. But you know, in trying to answer the question of why do the numbers come out the way they do, as high as they do, I think that those are probably two of the big um, major reasons. And the same thing goes for conservative Catholics. There has been a lot of writing in recent years on the evangelicalization of American white Catholics. Um, you sort of see American white Catholics involved in politics and, and even involved in the life of the church in ways that resemble American Protestants. They, they have a lot more affinity with white Protestants who are conservative than they do with Catholics of color or Catholics who are progressive, and they, they act out that way in society. Um, and, and I think that perfectly explains uh, why you saw you know, Catholics kind of split down the middle in terms of Trump white Catholics. Okay. My name is Alexander Duan. I'm a senior at Brandeis University. Um, you talked a lot about the economic beliefs of the um, Christian left. Where are they on other issues that are important to the left, like climate change, homosexuality, um, and issues that would like, um, does it vary by de denomination and individual? Is it enlarged more conservative than the mainstream left, more liberal? What would you say? So just because you have um, 
a necessary mix of sort of more conservative denominations. The Christian left is going to come out more conservative um, than the sort of secular left, uh, just by necessity, um, just because you're averaging in um, sort of denominations that are either having some discussions or arguments about issues that the secular left has already settled. Um, in terms of climate change, yes, there are denominational differences. The Christian left seems very interested in climate change and actually has been for a while, since the 70s, before it was you know, sort of known as climate change and when it was thought of as creation care. Um, there have been a lot of progressive Christians who are involved in, in um, sort of contributing to the care for, uh, of the earth. Um, and, and I think those movements are still pretty strong. Those currents are still pretty strong in the Christian left. Um, homosexuality, um, you see the, those debates working out inside each denomination, sort of Methodists recently have had a big, the uh, United Methodist Church has had a big row over it. Presbyterians had their own big argument over it. Episcopalians, the ship seems to have sailed, questions mostly settled. Um, but you know, you see uh, those denominations sort of duking it out internally. Um, abortion. Again, you know, all the greatest hits here, everybody's favorite subjects. Um, <laughs> you see a lot of variation. Um, and, and there always has been a lot of variation among progressive Christians on that issue. Um, you know, progressive Catholics tend to be more ardently pro-life. Progressive Protestants, um, you might see some, uh, some stronger pro-choice uh, points of view emerging there. Um, but yeah, so it is, it's different. It's a different culture. It's a different texture um, than the secular left. But I think still quite a lot of alignment. My name is Elena, and I'm studying religion and politics over at the Divinity School. My question builds a little bit on yours. Um, I'm curious about what you think about the role of pro-life Christians in the progressive left, especially in their relation to like other communities within the left that aren't religious. So there might be pro-life Christians who want to continue to see the abortion rate decreasing as it has under President Obama's presidency, but would rather fight for that through things like accessible maternity care, parental leave, better wages for workers so that they can support families. Is that a conversation that you see happening among religious groups within the left and non-religious groups like the nuns, or is that something that you think is still developing? And if it is a conversation, or if not, what are things that Christians can do to better uh, move that conversation along? Yeah, so in terms of you know how pro-life Christians on the left um, relate to um, the sort of secular left, um, I think that uh, there is, it's a very nuanced difference. So I think that most people, most secular leftists would say they don't have any interest in seeing the abortion rate go up, you know, for no other reason than it's a medical procedure you don't need to have, shouldn't submit yourself to surgery if it's possible to avoid it. Um, and, and, you know, abortion represents people being put in a position where they have to do something um, that's, you know, somewhat dangerous to them and their person. And I think that most people on the left would say they would, you know, rather have those rates go down or, or be stable, um, you know, because people have access to birth control. I think that's a pretty typical secular left position. And then, and then the Christian pro-life progressive position um, is, well, we want to see those rates come down um, because abortion is, is, a, is, an, is an evil that we don't want to see um, in, in society. And some progressive Christians tend to say the best way to do that is not through legalizing it because bans have had mixed results uh, in countries where they've taken place and because it means involving the sort of penal carceral state in, in this very sort of tender place in people's lives. And that uh, for, the, for the greater good, um, the better way to reduce those rates is through, like you were saying, uh, universal health care, universal paid leave, um, having access to uh, education, um, and in some cases, progressive Christians advocate access to birth control. Um, the nuance that I would say that comes from the secular left is the secular left, especially in recent years, I'd say the last five or ten years, has expressed concern with sort of the stigmatization of abortion, that this shouldn't even carry a stigma, that even if it is the case that we would prefer rates be low or stable, um, <coughs> the political emphasis on reducing rates results in a stigmatization of women who have abortions, uh, which the secular left tends to think that's very unfair and it results in a real drop in quality of life and it's part of what makes these procedures dangerous and hard to find. Um, and as long as we participate in that narrative, we're going to be hurting women. 
And so that for puts the progressive Christian pro-lifers in a bind, right? Because there's no way for them to say what they believe um, without contributing to a narrative that can be described as, you know, stigmatizing abortion. So, so that is a sort of a delicate conflict. It has to do with the sort of rhetorics of each side. Um, and it might, I think it's an irresolvable rhetorical difference. Um, and I think that the best way to solve irresolvable rhetorical differences is to focus on praxis. Um, and so in this case, it would mean um, doing less talking, more coalition building around, say, universal health care. I think that one's within reach. Um, it's a movement that's building steam. Progressive Christians get on board with the secular left there. And I think that, um, you know, in terms of reasoning about why that is inside progressive Christian circles, you're sort of free to discuss as you will. Um, but that coalition in and of itself, I don't think needs to have a pronouncedly, um, you know, Christian progressive pro-life uh, statement. It, it, its statement is sufficient morally on its own. And then the knock-on effects are something that the progressive pro-life Christians can be really excited about, I think. Hi, I'm uh, Jeff Rousset. I'm a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. Um, I'm curious to hear, what do you think it might take to really rupture the alliance between evangelicals and conservatives? And um, what potential do you see in Reverend William Barber and the Poor People's Campaign's attempts to revive uh, religious left? I see a lot of potential in, in Reverend Barber's Poor People's Campaign, and I think that... Um, Tell them about Reverend Barber's Poor People's Campaign. So Reverend William, Bar Reverend William Barber is a black uh, Christian. Um, he has been uh, sort of leading a sort of civil rights-like um, campaign to get um, people interested in issues, Christians interested in issues based that in affect North the Carolina. poor. It's based in North Carolina. Yes, um, and, and uh, I think he was very responsive to the events that happened in Charlottesville last year, for example. Um, there was a lot of attention um, around the Poor People's Campaign at that time. They participate in Moral Mondays, um, which are, you know, sort of meetings, events where um, people sort of discuss progressive Christians on, uh, progressive Christian positions on sort of pressing political issues. Um, and he's just been a very steady, very reliably, morally clear voice um, for progressive Christianity um, for a good time now. I think that when you really see the left Christians shine is at inflection points where society is sort of changing and there's a, a possibility of going one way or the other. This is what happened in civil rights. Um, and progressive Christians sort of step up and provide moral clarity in a moment that otherwise seems unclear or uncertain. Um, civil rights, something that had to happen. You know, racial equality is a is absolutely necessary under a Christian logic, and there's just no two ways about it, and we have to be clear on that. Uh, and, and I think that progressive Christians now have another opportunity to do that, um, especially as we discuss the economy more and more in political terms. Stop looking at it as something that is sort of outside politics or free of politics, and view the economy as something that is in the con within the control of politicians. And, and there needs to be some clarity then if we're going to say we need to manage our economy in some way. We need to um, respond to the situation it's put us in politically in some way. Um, in terms of inequality, in terms of people lacking health care access and basic quality of life. We're going to ha have to respond to that. I think progressive Christians can provide a lot of moral clarity around what that response should look like. And I think that is what's so fantastic about the Poor People's Campaign, is it's answering those questions um, from a progressive Christian point of view that is clear, that is resonant, that people seem to respond to. I know that um, secular left leaders like Bernie Sanders um, and Keith Ellison have, have been interacting with members of that uh, community, um, which I take as a very good sign. Talk to me a little bit more deeply about this idea that there's something anathema in racial inequality and religion, or in particular Christianity, because as you fully uh, understand, before the Civil War, there was a deep biblical split mm -hmm. in which this many Southern white clergy and believers used the text of both the Old and New Testament to validate slavery, which has to be one of the most repellent forms of racial inequality imaginable. What, what changed? How did we get to a position like the one you just articulated from a starting place like that? Well, so Christianity um, did not begin uh, racist. Um, if for no other reason than that the categories we now think of as racial didn't exist in the, in the earliest days of Christianity. 
Augustine talked about himself as an African. He was very emphatic about having an African heritage. We don't know what he looked like. Uh, most of the time that you see him, he's in Renaissance paintings, he's like a blue-eyed white guy. Extremely <laughs> unlikely, um, based on his mother's name. South Africa has a few blue-eyed <laughs> white guys. He said he was South Africa. Based on, his, based on his mother's name and his father and the wh uh, where he was born and the way he talked about himself as being someone who was different than most Romans. He, he thought of himself as different than most Romans. He was emphatically an mm. African. Mm. Um, he was probably half black. Um, and, uh, you know, that's how we would describe him now. Um, and, and there was not even an inkling in his mind, nor should there have been, that anything about the Christian religion would imply that, that he would be um, of, of a lesser status because of that. Um, this is something that gets pulled out of Christianity by necessity as colonialism becomes a way of making a lot of building a lot of wealth uh, in Europe. And that's where you get heavily racialized Christianity out of. Um, and, uh, you know, throughout the Middle Ages, you see there are black saints, there are saints from all over the world, again, because it just doesn't make any sense um, to try to uh, project racism onto Christianity. That it doesn't make any sense doesn't mean it hasn't been done with success. Um, if Christianity is one of sort of your guiding social narratives and you uh, need to import racism into it uh, in order to, you know, carry out colonial mm -hmm. uh, activities or, or other forms of racial oppression that uh, build wealth for a few, um, then you're going to force that narrative and, and it can stick. I mean, that was certainly what you saw happening with the Bob Jones University case. Evangelicals have been heavily indoctrinated and felt like um, somehow that was a big part of their religious belief. Um, but coming from a theological background, it's just not. It's, it's absolutely a manipulation and a lie um, that Christianity has any any text or any context which would provide support for a racist reading of the religion. Um, and, and it's a sin, moreover, racism. Um, it's, a, it's a way of talking about God's creation um, that is um, insulting to God, that denies the image of God, which God says is in all people. Um, it's a heresy and it's a blasphemy. And it's, a, it's incredibly dangerous. Um, I'm Hossein Barashan, I'm a fellow at Shortstein. Um, in terms of media, where you know I think Schrodinger is focused on media, um, what's what's the situation with these different groups on the Christianity? Which one is much more inclined towards using modern media, including television? I think at the center of it. And why do you think, theoretically or um, you know conceptually, what makes them so inclined towards television? Yeah, so, you know, the Protestants have been good at TV for a long time. Um, you have televangelists who sort of were famous, especially in the 80s and 90s. Evangelicals Protestants in particular. In mainline, yeah. Nobody watches Episcopal TV series. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, the, the, I think the greatest uh, mainline Protestant minister to have ever uh, taken on TV was maybe Mr. Rogers. <laughs> um, Norman Vincent Peale will be hurt. But yeah. <laughs> I think that's a plausible argument. Um, yeah, and and I mean uh, it's it's a it's a demotic medium in certain respects. Um, uh, as you said demotic, not yeah. demonic, right? I just want to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> Both. Oh, <okay>. um, <laughs> <laughs> it's demotic. It it, it, uh, it as TV sort of proliferated and became common throughout society. It was something that almost every family could have access to. Um, and you know, it wasn't this rarefied uh, form of media. Catholics were good at radio in like the 30s. Um, you see a lot of that. And Catholics love publications, right? Like three Catholics will have four newspapers among them. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and Catholics still are pretty good at publications. Catholics are also extremely online. Oh, um, yeah, you, I've seen a lot of that. America Magazine is really online. First Things is really online. I think it's just a, f a function of having sort of young people running their social media accounts. Um, and Pope Francis has been very media friendly as well. Um, and he's been very good at sort of using TV. He did this sort of televised meetings a while back with people from all over the world. Um, and he's very good about um, sort of talking with sort of off the beaten path media. Um, and, and sometimes that's TV, sometimes it's radio, sometimes it's print interviews, but he puts a lot of emphasis on smaller media um, so he can get into, um, get his message into markets where maybe big broadcast media isn't really touching. Um, uh, I mean, I think that, I think at this point, TV is, is maybe seeming less and less like the future um, to, to Christians who are sort of approaching the media market. They seem to be moving towards online and social media. Do any of them resist visual media? Uh, sort of like for principled reasons. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, I mean the Amish. Um, <laughs> you, you don't see a lot of. Uh, um, you don't see a lot of um, 
sort of principled holdouts, I don't think, anymore. Um, you rarely, uh, there, there are probably still conservative Christians who think in the vein of TV as sort of a pornographied space that is, you know, vastly distracting. Um, and you, you also see Catholics, or Cardinal Sarah wrote a book about the power of silence, about sort of disconnecting from those forms of media that just sort of blast you with information 24-7. Um, um, but in the main, I would say the institutional bodies inside Christianity have been pretty friendly towards uh, TV and, and towards social media at this point. Let me take one more question here. Uh, yes, sir, in the blue shirt, could you identify yourself? Yeah. Uh, hello, um, uh, I'm Casey, I, I'm a senior at Brandeis. Um, and um, I wanted to ask, uh, you, wrote, you wrote about this a little in some of your previous columns as well, but like, um, how do you think the religious left should deal with, I, I guess, what you call like growing um, like social alienation slash atomization in America, which I think you, you're seeing being reflected in multiple trends like um, like the opioid epidemic, um, like the, the declining life expectancy, like what what Robert Putnam called like the the the, the, the decline of social capitals, and, and like and I, I think that's getting more difficult with the rise of the of the of the, of the non of the non affiliated the demographic in in the religious landscape. Since like then you don't have that natural. Um, community based around the based around the church, I suppose. Uh, I suppose so. So yeah. So what what role do you think the religious left can? In terms of responding to sort of, you know, hyper-individualism or atomization, sort of social alienation, people feeling lonely, disconnected, um, I think that the, the most important contribution the religious left can make is a contribution um, that, uh, of helping people identify why social alienation is so dangerous. And the, the Christian left story on that would be because it's unnatural. It's actually opposed to what we are as creatures, that people are, you know, so Alistair McIntyre's terms, dependent rational animals. We need one another. Um, in the earliest chapters of the Bible, you have God himself saying, it's just not good for people to be alone. And, uh, and, and the whole Bible attests to this necessity of togetherness. Jesus had friends, he had family, um, and they were the people closest to him, and they're a huge part of his story, and they're a huge part of the Christian story. Um, and, and Christianity has at its heart this recognition that human beings need one another, that we are not individual creatures. We're not made to be that way. We have individual moral value, um, we have an individual relationship with God, if, if you want to put it in those terms. Um, but those things are all facilitated and supported um, by these networks of other people um, who tell us about ourselves and about our place in the world. And so to, to think about people in these immense and very thick tapestries of, of connectedness, um, not as, as being a problem or as being a defect or being something that we want to solve with technology or new social forms, um, but as something good that we want to preserve and support and flourish. And we want to make those networks um, as, uh, as um, liberating as possible. They free people to fully be themselves, but you are most fully yourself in those networks of being. I think that is the contribution that the Christian left really has to, has to make at this time. And, and it's, a, it's a moral narrative. It tells people something um, about the way society ought to be. And it's a starting point from which you can move to um, what policies ought to look like, what policies fit in with that logic of connectedness and togetherness, and what policies militate against it. You know, and that's a lot of the thinking that I do um, in my column, hopefully uh, more clearly than I speak. Um, done a marvelous job. Thank you very much. But but I think that I think that um, there is a there is a tendency in liberal societies with this great utilitarian background to only try to say things that are um, useful in some way, that are effective, that are going to move the ball or have some uh, legible policy outcome. But there's this great alternative tradition, which is it is worth knowing something just because it's true. And Leo Tolstoy says this, and the kingdom of God is within you, and this great Christian pacifist tract that uh, Christianity was the first religion in Tolstoy's reckoning um, that you were supposed to believe not because it would make you beautiful or strong or wealthy, but just because it was true. Just because it was true. And I think that that kind of logic in terms of what people really are, connected, dependent creatures, just because it's true is something that the Christian left has to offer and, and is especially important at this time. Discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you.
And well, I think the platforms know. have been very reluctant to see themselves as what they are, which is media companies. They don't, they, you know, Facebook is the best example of this. Facebook does not want to see itself as a media company, even though it is one. Uh, because, you know, for example, people are uh, filming, uh, you know, sh shootings on Facebook with Facebook Live. They're, they're creating news on it. They're doing all kinds of things. And Facebook constantly makes editorial decisions 